Hi, and welcome. I'm Josh Lumley, and I will be giving you the lectures on the respiratory system. This first set is going to be obstructive and restrictive pulmonary diseases. This is the first of three lectures. I have to apologize for being a little bit hoarse. I am getting over a cold. Let's go ahead and get started. This lecture is going to cover two main themes, uh, upper airway tracheobronchial as well as parenchymal obstructive pulmonary disease. So let's go ahead and get started. Upper airway tracheobronchial. We're going to cover that for about the next 10 or so slides. So um, let's think about obstructive sleep apnea. And this is Wilford Brimley, pretty famous meme on the internet. Obviously he's famous for his diabetes commercials. I don't know anything about Wilford Brimley's health. Uh, other than looking at him, I can pretty much tell he probably has obstructive sleep apnea. So what are the general themes for obstructive sleep apnea? Um, it is apnea for 10 seconds, uh, about five times an hour, associated with a uh, concomitant decrease in pulse oximetry of about 4%. Obviously the gold standard for this is polysomnography. That's what you have to do to diagnose this. Um, certainly all of us, can look at our patients, evaluate them, and tell with a high degree of certainty whether or not they've had a sleep study or not that a patient uh, likely has OSA. Obviously, as we know, untreated obstructive sleep apnea can lead to many deleterious things. Obviously, there's systemic and, of course, pulmonary hypertension from retention of CO2, left ventricular hypertrophy from the uh, systemic hypertension, various arrhythmias from right atrial uh, enlargement and of course just due to the lack of sleep these patients that are at exquisitely high risk for uh, sudden um, sleepiness uh, and cognitive impairment while obesity is the most important risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea um, we should know that of our population of diagnosed osa patients um, most of them are not obese, but do recall that is front and center uh, the, uh, the most important risk factor. So um, let's talk about stop bang. Obviously this is in these patients that have not had polysomnography for confirmation of having obstructive sleep apnea. What is the stop bang criteria? So um, a uh, acronym, S being snoring, T being tiredness, daytime sleepiness, not just, Josh, I'm tired of listening to you, I'm tired at baseline. This is, I'm literally having trouble keeping my eyes open and I'm falling asleep while you're talking to me. Uh, observed apnea and P is for pressure, blood pressure, uh, they need to be hypertensive. Uh, B being BMI greater than 35, A, age greater than 50, N equals neck circumference of greater than 40 centimeters, and G, gender male. Stop bang uh, criteria. So you don't have to be a, a uh, pulmonary critical care doc uh, who has done a uh, sleep, uh, sleep fellowship to be able to tell that the um, irregular uh, polysomnography on, the, on screen right uh, is consistent with obstructive sleep apnea. So if you look at on the left, you see pretty much linear, stable EEG patterns, EMG patterns, um, uh, EKG, blood pressure, a chest and abdomen that works in synchrony and it has coordinated airflow as indicated by uh, tidal volumes, and then a stable uh, oxygen saturation of high 90s, 100%. Now, if you look on screen right, this is for patients that do have a, uh, that are affected by obstructive sleep apnea, and this is a patient who's actively undergoing uh, an obstructive episode. So EEG, EKG are largely unaffected. What you see is that when a patient is having, um, uh, is uh, nearing the end of an obstructive episode, they start to become hypertensive. So that's where you see the blood pressure rising. Um, of course, you see at the beginning, abdomen and chest moving um, uh, not synchronous and uh, tidal volume being zero. Obviously, they're breathing against a closed glottis or some sort of obstruction. So uh, tidal volume is low and then saturation starts to trail off and then they get that 
as they wake up. That snoring episode, abdomen and chest work in synchrony. They start to have breathing, a tidal volume, saturation comes back up. And of course, after this long period of holding and increasing CO2 and decreasing oxygen saturation, that's when you see the blood pressure start to rise. So what are our recommendations for managing a patient with obstructive sleep apnea? Of course, as we talk about another famous meme, we have the Wolf of Brimley, Wolf of Brimley cat. Don't know much about veterinary medicine other than looking at that cat. I would imagine he or she has OSA. So obviously we want to risk uh, exacerbating their OSA. So in this case here, we would like to avoid the use of uh, opioids. So that makes a regional anesthetic optimal. Um, a, that is superior, of course, to a neuraxial anesthetic. Um, oral opioids, if you have to, are okay, but uh, are viewed less favorably than doing a regional anesthetic or a neuraxial anesthetic. And then, of course, um, last but not least, worst for these patients would be parenteral uh, opioids. Certainly, uh, if at all possible, you'd like to take care of these patients first case of the day um, so that you can monitor them. Uh, in the PACU and uh, make sure that their oxygen saturation is stable before sending them home. Of course, you want to make sure that you've given them oxygen saturation until they have been weaned off oxygen and then, of course, they, you, they need to have a two-hour period uh, without stimulation of stable oxygen saturation. After extubation, these patients, of course, as we know, are largely dependent on their CPAP machine, so whether or not you've worked with uh, pre-anesthesia testing to have them uh, bring their uh, CPAP machine with them or you need to work with respiratory therapy to make sure you've got CPAP in the PACU. If at all possible, avoid non-supine positions. Uh, and then uh, finally, usually 24 hours pulse oximetry uh, at least after surgery to make sure that there's not saturations uh, while on parenteral opioids while in-house. Question. Which of the following is not predictive of difficult mask ventilation? A, obesity. B, age greater than 60. C, prominent incisors. D, Malampati 3 or 4 view. E, snoring. Or F, a beard. And the answer here is C, prominent incisors. Difficulty in mask ventilation, this has been studied actually, um, can be remembered by the following mnemonic, obese um. So obesity, a beard, being elderly, snoring, absence of teeth, and mom potty three or four. Now remember that prominent incisors, while that may be predictive of a difficult intubation, prominent incisors are not predictive of uh, difficult mask ventilation. Obviously our most common cause of upper airway or tracheobronchial obstruction is obstructive sleep apnea, but do recall that congenital abnormalities, infectious neoplastic uh, causes a foreign body or trauma, um, such as a, uh, a tracheal stenosis from, or tracheomalacia from a healed tracheostomy, those can cause upper airway obstructions. As we talked about, OSA is the most common. Of course, these patients have daytime sleepiness, snoring, observed apnea, elevated blood pressure, elevated BMI, uh, age greater than uh, 50, large neck circumference, and gender uh, are the criteria for screening in the absence of polysomnography. That's called the stop bang criteria. We wanna consider a regional or neuraxial uh, technique to decrease the amount of systemic opioids that these patients are exposed to uh, during hospitalization. Of course, that does impact uh, what uh, is our role as anesthesiologists in allowing or preventing these sorts of patients uh, from having surgeries in the ambulatory setting. Um, and how do we manage them? Do we let them go home? Can we do a regional technique? Do we do them first case of the day and uh, hold them for eight hours while making sure that their uh, pulse oximetry is stable? or do we go ahead and refer them to a tertiary care center where they can be admitted for 23-hour observations? <clears throat> and then finally, uh, knowing that some of these patients, of course, may be having inpatient surgeries, uh, what is the role for post-op uh, pulse oximetry in the face of having parenteral opioids?
Okay, so for the rest of the lecture, we're going to talk about uh, parenchymal causes of obstructive and restrictive pulmonary disease. Start off with a question. The hallmark finding of COPD based on pulmonary function test slash spirometry is A, decreased functional residual capacity, B, increased tidal volume, C, decreased PaCO2, D, decreased force expiratory volume over force vital capacity ratio, FEV1 over FEC. And the answer here? is D, decreased, forced, uh, decreased FEV1 uh, over FVC ratio. With COPD, as we recall, uh, functional residual capacity is increased. Um, FEV, uh, sorry, the ERV doesn't really change, but it's residual volume that does increase. Tidal volume remains unchanged. PaCO2 is elevated, um, but uh, the COPD is characterized by a decreased FEV1 over FVC ratio. All right, let's talk a little bit about asthma. So what is asthma and what causes it? So we need to think about allergens of some sort, seasonal dog dander, um, a, uh, exposure to some atmospheric agent uh, that binds to IgE and results in mast cell degranulation. Intraoperatively, it's commonly caused by overwhelming parasympathetic nervous system stimulation. Of course, other uh, causes of this can be just the act of intubating, uh, sorry, just the act of intubation, um, cold, agitation or anxiety surrounding the surgery, uh, or exercise can all result in overwhelming parasympathetic stimulation, uh, which results in bronchiolar constriction and increase in secretions. We do need to recall that aspirin on its own uh, can trigger a uh, asthma crisis as it results in prostaglandin inhibition. And do recall prostaglandins, they result in bronchodilation. What is our therapy for asthma? So acutely, so why don't you think about acute, intermediate, and long-term therapy, long-term slash preventive therapy. So acutely, the therapy that you would give a patient that is having uh, an acute asthma episode would be a beta-2 agonist. So that's like uh, albuterol. It's going to cause direct bronchiolar relaxation uh, due to bronchiolar smooth muscle relaxation. Then in the intermediate phase, uh, you've got your anticholinergics, so ifratropium. Those have a delayed onset, usually over hours, and they are useful for prophylaxis, not for an acute asthma episode. <clears throat> Inhaled steroids, again, that's chronic maintenance, so chronic decrease and suppression of airway inflammation, like inhaled beclomethasone, does not work or is not really, uh, is not first line therapy for an acute asthma episode. And then finally, chromalin sodium, which results in mast cell stabilization. Again, long term maintenance therapy, not used for the acute episode. So, what is uh, the role of our anesthetic agents and our choice of anesthetic agents and their impact on asthma? Do recall that propofol alone reduces airway resistance. What we see in the chart uh, below these bullets is that uh, we've got a study looking at various tidal volumes and patients that uh, do have asthma episodes. Uh, the use of propofol versus uh, uh, without propofol. And what we see is that across the board, whether it be peak pressure, plateau pressure, or in general airway resistance, um, across the board uh, for all tidal volumes, we see a statistically significant reduction in peak pressure, plateau pressure, and airway resistance by using propofol um, versus uh, no propofol. Ketamine in and of itself causes smooth muscle relaxation. It is also known to be helpful in patients that have asthma. Recall that morphine causes histamine release, so you can have a, um, a worsening of asthma symptoms by giving morphine. Um, Non-depolarizing uh, muscular blockers, mivacurium being the main one, um, can cause histamine release. And then recall that while desflurane and sevoflurane can both cause cause bronchodilation, the, um, the sevoflurane is the optimal choice in patients that have asthma or severe COPD, both for airway reactivity as well as uh, bronchiolar uh, 
um, relaxation and dilation. Question, which of the following drugs could be used for management of both acute and chronic asthma? And the answer here is B, terbutylene. So know that both Timolol and Propranolol aren't going to work uh, at all. They're beta blockers, which means they can trigger bronchiolar constrictions. So that's the exact opposite of what we want. Ritadrin is a beta agonist, but it is specific uh, to myometrium. So we give that for tocolysis and, um, and uh, elimination of preterm labor uh, or treatment of preterm lab labor. Um, terba terbutylene is the correct answer here. It is a nonspecific beta agonist. It can give both bronchiolar relaxation or it can give myometrial relaxation and tocolysis. Okay. So key points for this section, of course, realize that albuterol, that's what we use for acute therapy. We can also use low-dose epi um, at, for, with acute therapy uh, when albuterol fails. So that can also give bronchial or smooth muscle relaxation. You want to give steroids, inhaled steroids, excuse me, for chronic therapy. Um, and acute, uh, so asthma itself is, uh, can be caused by acute activation of the parasympathetic system. So um, exercise, agitation, um, anxiety, or intubation can, in a cold operating room can trigger this. And then, of course, what you want to keep in the back of your mind is, what, is that you definitely want beta activation, but specifically you want beta-2 activation. All right, so let's think back to our uh, second year of medical school where we're learning about spirometry. So you absolutely have to memorize this chart uh, before the exam. You need to know this backwards and forwards um, and just cold. In patients with COPD, the pattern of lung function tests excludes which of the following? A reduced FEV1, B, an increased vital capacity, C, an increased total lung capacity, or D, a reduced diffusing capacity of the lungs for carbon monoxide, DLCO. And the answer here is B, increased vital capacity. So again, we've got these fluffy inelastic lungs when we have a patient that has COPD. So um, FEV1 is decreased. We do see an increased total lung capacity, um, but that is largely due to residual volume. DLCO is decreased in, the, and, uh, in these patients, um, and the lower it is, the, uh, the uh, worse the patient's prognosis is. What we see is vital capacity is the correct answer in this case because vital capacity, of course, is composed, comprised of three parts. Um, IRV, tidal volume, and ERV. All three of those values remain the same uh, or largely stable in a patient with uh, COPD. So what is emphysema exactly? Um, it is airflow obstruction with exhalation. So these patients are characterized um, as having air trapping. We see a decreased FEV1 over FVC ratio. Of course, it's um, less than 80% means they have it, less than 60% is moderate COPD, and less than 40% or less than 50% is considered um, severe COPD. You really want to start focusing on those patients that have um, an FEV1 over FEC ratio of less than 50%. As I mentioned earlier, they do have an increased uh, FRC, but that's comprised largely of residual volume. And do recall that they have an increased PaCO2. So entitled CO2 is decreased, increased PaCO2. Um, therefore, you want to think about them having large, large volumes of dead space ventilation. So ABG analysis in a patient that has chronic COPD is going to demonstrate compensatory metabolic alkalosis to deal with their chronic retention of uh, carbon dioxide. What makes up the umbrella of emphysema? Chronic bronchitis, emphysema, I'm sorry, uh, makes up COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, CF, bronchiectasis, asthma, and bronchiolitis obliterans.
Question, which of the following PFTs increases with COPD? A, vital capacity, B, total lung capacity, E, FEV1, D, tidal volume, or E, expiratory, reserve, expiratory residual volume? And the answer here is total lung capacity. So remember, it's residual volume that increases dramatically in a patient with COPD. Therefore, their FRC increases as well. But tidal volume, vital capacity, um, IRV, ERV, those are largely unchanged. Of course, as we recall, they're big fluffy lungs, so FEV1 is decreased. DLCO, what is it? So DLCO is an independent predictor for risk of postoperative complications. It reflects the alveolar membrane integrity and the ability and pulmonary capillary blood flow. So two components, you got capillary blood flow flowing next to the alveolus. Um, so what can impair DLCO? Having a thickened capillary membrane uh, or having uh, decreased capillary blood flow. If you have a low DLCO, then that implies significant emphysema, re reduced capillary vascular bed, so decreased capillary blood flow to those distal alveoli. Um, recall that DLCO can actually be slightly elevated in a patient or paradoxically elevated in a patient that has COPD. You may see a number that's a little bit higher and say to yourself, well, maybe this patient isn't as sick as I thought they were. In these sorts of patients, um, that is actually a worse prognosis because that's a sign of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy due to uh, chronic CO2 retention um, and core pulmonale. So that RV keeps pushing against those tightened pulmonary arteries, um, gets larger, you get right ventricular hypertrophy to force that blood through there. That actually elevates DLCO. Uh, but again, what that is a marker of is uh, significantly affected and uh, cardiovascular remodeling due to elevated CO2 retention. So a couple of the things you want to remember from this lecture, obviously, uh, or this portion of the lecture, obviously, are that COPD, um, this is an x-ray consistent with it. They have bullous, very fluffy lungs. They have a uh, profoundly increased expiratory time because these lungs have lost their elasticity. <clears throat> Dead space ventilation uh, is increased in these patients and they have, and that is uh, consistent with their elevated or their increased residual volume, which, uh, which is consistent also with an increased total lung capacity. Do recall there's an increased PaCO2 to end tidal CO2 gradient. And then of course, um, these patients are chronic, therefore they have a chronic respiratory acidosis with a compensatory metabolic alkalosis. And that is it for this lecture. Thank you very much.